I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on forensic science. And for those of you that uh, have attended any of our webinars, uh, we have club coordinators of uh, science is Sharon Story for Math is Pam Summers, and technology is me, Tracy Clatton Smith. I'm the one that sends out the emails and the reminders and things like that, as well as uh, keeping a, a look on our web page and keeping archives up to date for us. And Pam and I have been educators for many years, and so we are very happy to be able to share um, uh, our speakers that we've uh, put together for you today. And hopefully you'll find this to be an enlightening and uh, interesting talk. About our WebEx webinar environment, um, the chat box, as well as the QA. Please make sure that you verify your rich media players and that you have those prepared. All of you that uh, have registered earlier, you did receive an email from me with the links for both of uh, our videos that are involved, so that way you could watch them beforehand or you could have them open and ready to watch during that time that we get to it in the presentation. That just helps those of you that have a little bit slower connections for video streaming. I'll turn it over to Pam and Sharon, and I can tell you a little bit about our program and, and a big thank you to our sponsors. I remind you that this opportunity was given to us by um, the SAM, the National Science Foundation STEM Education and Outreach. We received some money from a grant from Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math to be able to do this. So we'll enjoy today's presentation. So a little bit of background before we get started. So let's take a look at just how old forensic science actually is. We, and most of you think about forensic science as being CSI or all of the new shows that have been on for several years. But really, forensic science goes back to Julius Caesar. Remember how Julius Caesar was assassinated? One physician claimed that out of all 23 wounds that Julius Caesar suffered, only one of those wounds actually was fatal. So one was the only one that killed him. All the others were just a little painful. This is also the forensic investigation of Caesar's death. Are you surprised that forensic science actually goes back that far or that long? The forensic science goes back to thousands of years, approximately 44 BC. The term forensic has been derived from the Latin word forensis, which means of or before the forum, because they took it to large forums and they would discuss the process. Much we do with our panels of doctors today whenever we have a death that is unexpected. In terms, it means the process of applying scientific principles to logically answer questions that are existing. So I go through the scientific method every time we use forensic science. Crime investigators will take pictures of blood stains and blood splatter evidence and carefully analyze these patterns. We also can reconstruct the scene using forensic discipline, for example, pathology, which will look at the total cause of death, your DNA that is there, or anthropology and blood pattern interpretation. We're extremely lucky today to have two very wonderful experts with us. And so we're going to take two of these disciplines, which is our blood pattern uh, interpretation and our ballistics, and we're going to look at both of these and give you some uh, general knowledge about both of these. So happy to have Chief Deputy Ricky Glitz with us today. As you can see from the screen, he's a 49 year veteran of law enforcement. I'm going to go ahead and read through all of this because we actually have him available to tell us a little bit about him. How are you doing, Glitz? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much for inviting me to this, you, Stacy, and Pam. We would for you to tell the audience and the students a little bit about your background. How are you interested in this? What you do on a daily basis? What you did on a daily basis? And then teach us a little bit about some stuff that you've been doing. Well, uh, I am in sunny Monterey, California right now at, guess what, an association of clean reconstructions. There's about 50 people, probably 100 yards from me, and I took the time out from, from three of lectures and presentations, of which I did one, which I'm going to share with you. 
and we have people from around the world. We have an individual from London. We have one from Israel. I got to spend a little bit of time with him. What do uh, I started uh, 49 years ago in California as a police officer and went to a murder scene that I made a huge mistake on and buried myself saying it was a, a murder where there was blood all over this room late at night and I was a rookie. I called out detectives and said it was an axe murder and when in fact the person had been, it was all around, he had ulcers and he was an alcoholic and throwing up. And, and I will learn everything I can about that. Well, over the years, uh, I began studying crime scenes. I became a detective in Los Angeles and then moved to Portland, Oregon, uh, where I retired from the sheriff's office in uh, 1995 as a chief deputy. And then I continued my business of consulting around the country and internationally and lecturing uh, on uh, blood and cases and many reconstruction. And all those disciplines, Tracy, you just got through talking about because are so important to a reconstructionist. Uh, I agree, and I uh, love what I do. If I had it to do all over again, I'd do the same thing, and it's been a great, rewarding career. And I find a lot of trials, as late as two weeks ago, which I'm going to share with you, something really fresh. Okay. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you doing the last two weeks with this trial? Well, this is a trial where it's a 28-year-old case in uh, the state of Wyoming. And as you know, we were I was talking when you first assigned me to this project. I was in a motel room, and now I'm talking to you again. I'm in my motel room. Seems like I'm always on the move with you. And, uh, and I testified in this trial and did a lot of demonstrations for the jurors in the form of a role uh, a female the same size as the victim who was murdered eight years ago. Uh, she was stopped along the highway at 6 o'clock in the morning and she was shot uh, a couple of times. I will share with you some non graphic photographs of what was done in that courtroom. So I had a mannequin that I shipped there and had that mannequin dressed in her bloody clothing in addition to doing some props and joining the jurors uh, by actually doing a tutorial, which I'm going to share with you, and then actually spattering blood and dropping blood in different patterns, because pattern interpretation, which tends to reconstruction, uh, it's all about patterns. So I will share that with you when we get down to those slides. And then I remember when we first met, when we were talking, and I, the way I found you was I found you with, through your book, actually. And I was just, I was proud that it's so easy for me to contact you, and you were so gracious to contact back immediately and being willing to do this. Can you tell us a little bit about your book? Yes, it's a book that came out uh, April the 13th of 2010. It took us four years to write. I was approached by a literary agent in New York. He assigned a writer. We hit it off. Spent four years putting together a book that's uh, a true crime, having to do with a lot of cases from around the country, some celebrity cases, some not so. Uh, most deaths maybe don't seem too important. They're all incorporated in the book. And that interesting story of how I got started into blood patterns. It's selling very well. I, I, I had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, we're into our second one uh, as I speak. And I don't know when that will be coming out. Uh, and the book is not easy as you might think. So uh, it's been a, been a lot of fun, fun rather, and ruled. Many of you may know. Uh, wrote the foreword in the book, and Kathy Pizarro from New York, writer, and just the relationship that we've had in this has been great. Uh, you know, anyone that reads it, even if you're not into true crime, uh, because it's what really happens. It's not a penny on the back, trust me. A lot of errors that I made, a lot of mistakes, but that's been my best teacher. I can't imagine that you don't have the other authors and different people calling you and asking you your expertise. It's oftentimes the books that I read when they do, I know that many authors, and this is just the fiction part of the world, but they have called the experts to out about things because they base their, their books on actual facts instead of just made up stuff. And so I know you've picked a lot of my curiosity today, just wondering about celebrities. Just 
to send in me is just very curious about all of these kinds of things lately. So do you tell us a little bit about blood chest and our spatter patterns? Yes. In, in defining blood patterns or talking about blood patterns, I keep it very, very simple. It's a very technical area and discipline. Uh, I break it down for jurors, and, and I will be talking to you as though I'm talking to jurors. Somewhat. And I break it into three categories that you can see that you think that your audience can see these categories. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, low velocity patterns. Uh, mean velocity and high velocity. Very interesting facts about those different categories. Velocity, in which you will see pictures of, uh, are drops of blood 90 degrees. They just make round drops. And then when that angle increases, or let's say the floor, if you drop a drop from your nose and it goes to the floor, that's a round drop we call 90 degrees. If you tilt the floor and you're still standing on it and that drop hits the floor, but the floor is at an angle, then it becomes an angular drop, and the more acute that angle, the more elongated the drop. And what's interesting, the little pointed end that you can see under the 90 degree drops, those angular drops, that little point, that little non-blunt end at the base of each one, the direction that that is traveling. Uh, same with all liquids, you can do that with water, you can do that with ink, uh, any of those that have the viscosity of blood. But in which you look at the third pattern where it says blood into blood because that re reflects on the case that I'm going to be sharing with you momentarily. So let's, let's park that. That's one drop into another drop into another drop. And you as an audience can see those little spatters out to the side. That's significant. And that goes up in a rainbow type effect. It's so much you can't see it. It goes up as high as your knees. It goes up 18 inches. I love because of all the testing and testing and experience that have been done over the years. I do experiments all the time. And uh, look at other patterns as I move along. Down below that is just look back up one, please, Tracy. Okay. It's cast off. In other words, what's cast off? If I hit someone uh, with a hammer, first of all, there's no blood to shed on the first blow. But second and subsequent blows, if I come back, the hammer stops, the blood continues. Away with the little tails point, they'll point away from the way the hammer was going. In other words, the blood comes off of the hammer and hits a wall at least an acute angle. You can see the little tiny tails that are pointing from your left to your right. So that when an investigator he or she walks in, they see that immediately and they know that an event happened to the left of that and over to the right. So you eliminate that area and you concentrate on what happened where you know that the origin of that was. Moving up to hair impacts, uh, hair makes swipes that only look like hair. They make impacts that look like hair. Uh, and prints, you see that in the very middle of the poster. And then cloth swipes are different than all of those. So as you can see as we move to the second slide, that's just all about patterns that are recognizable. And then the velocity. This in areas of blunt trauma. This is where that beating occurs with that hammer or a fist. And there's two things to remember for the audience. Things that are paramount that people don't understand. And I have explained it to jurors a lot because of what they see on TV. First of all, there's a spatter on the first blow. And secondly, the attacker rarely gets that much blood on him or her. In meetings where there's just tremendous amounts of blood, uh, over again, and this is proven, and yet that person, the attacker, can walk out with maybe one drop on him or maybe no drops on him or her. And where it really get is on the shoes or something. And this is what's called a random distribution of some large drops that go away from the attacker in the direction of, of the bullet. And then that third category, as we move on, is velocity impact spatter, which comes from eye revolving machinery such as if I walk into the propeller of an airplane. That's going to create this mist-type pattern. How we relate that to law enforcement in, in crime scenes, a detective here, she will walk in, and you see this pattern, and know that you've got probably gunshot. You should see a bullet hole in the middle of the wall. You spray, and that's very, very significant for uh, you to understand all those different patterns. And when a bullet goes in, if you if you if you're watching me, 
if it flows into my head, my left temple, I think you can be pointing to my left temple. Until it goes in, blood will go back towards the ear. If I don't have a hat on or if I have a lot of hair, not as much will go back. But really blood will go back towards the shooter in the direction that the blood from that's called back matter. The bullet exits out of my right temple. And the forward that's called forward spatter, and that is also a cone shape of blood. So how do you show that to the jurors? And I'm going to transition in a moment into the Wyoming case where what you're about to see must the music demonstration of a bullet hitting different objects, vegetables, and a while show that that the tissue and glass and milk goes towards the shooter. And you can start that now. And the bullet that goes forward is called forward spatter and taking that cone shape. Now, a shooter gets, uh, shoots someone, because I'm 20 feet away, this mist only travels three to four feet. That's it. And that's what's significant. And if he has someone him or her, and we see this pattern, and yet they said they were in the bathroom, which happens all the time, uh, people spend time in bathrooms in shootings in any other place. To me. But when we see that on their clothing, then that is taken and seized and then testimony about it. So you can start that video now. Now, they did not hear the music. to see a good transition to the next line. I'm going to give all of you a little, little tiny test before I go in the case. And we'll wrap it. This is an actual scene in Florida. And we have all the patterns that I just talked about. So if you look at, and I know that you're muted, all the attendees, but if you look at the left, that's a pattern that I just discussed. And you can tell what direction the upper left, that pattern connects to with the little boy uh, in between from your to your right and at the top. That's a hair swipe. Where it's dense is where it begins. In the middle, a uh, bullseye is a big red swatch. That's a claw swipe. And then down in the middle, at the bottom, at the baseboard, was where it's for the bloody hand that's been beaten. Wife, and that's where hand transfers. So those are all identifiable. And then to the right of the hand is bloody hair. So where the swipe occurred, and then the person falls down, his head's up against the wall and hit with a little bang. So. That said, let's go to the, the next slide. And this lady was on the pavement that I mentioned in Wyoming, as where 28 years ago the charred body you're looking at in the middle, sort of the middle of the photograph. Uh, the blood flow is to my right as I look at the picture, and feet is what we're looking at. You'll see a big red circle, and that's drops of blood where she's walking around. It's important to tell the jurors, and we're going to go back to that first slide of low velocity of blood into blood. The side spatter out to the side. So told the jurors that this is what this is. She had been hit in the nose. It was witnessed by two people. And she's walking around, ripping the blood from the blow to her nose. So we go to the next slide. You will see uh, the, the, her actual feet. These shoes that the lady was wearing. You'll notice that all that little satellite spatter and some drops on the top, which are 90 degrees of her shoes, goes to the interior. But there is no spatter on the side. So it's important to demonstrate that to jurors. So the next slide will show you uh, the shoes that were actually taped to or glued to fiberboard. So it can actually show jurors and demonstrate them after showing them the tutorial chart you just saw, the blood blood, and satellite spatter on these nice clean pair of shoes not and stage blood. I don't use real blood in the courtroom. 
showed them that blood in the blood pattern. And uh, after showing them 90 degree drops, which you see in one little fiber board, it says 90 degrees, and angles. So that simplicity of that demonstration is important for people, jurors, and some of maybe your audience uh, to suggest to uh, people like visuals. It's very important in trials to show uh, visuals to people. So if you go to the next slide, the, this is a, an illustration. And I use a lot of illustrations. I bring this to closure because it was important for the to know this lady that was hit in the nose after she was stopped and was hit multiple times. She walks around before she's knocked to the ground. Well, how do I know that she was laying on the ground when the next shot fired? And it's because her hands up as she's laying on her back. This is the actual wound to her hand. The administrator from California in Hollywood is he's been with. Uh, Brother Brother Studios for years. He might be someone you might want to entertain having on a webinar. He's excellent, teach anatomy. But there's the actual wound that he's painting on to Lisa's hand. How do you know her hand was there? Well, that's an intermediate target. And the goes through her hand, and on the back side of her hand, exits through the palmar surface, and it breaks up bone and tissue. And the little pieces that you see there is bone. That bone and tissue, they become missiles and are very, very fast and they create defects on her clothing. If we go to the last slide, please. And she's on her back. You can see her hand. One, two of them, rather, were the very significant. You'll see her left leg is lifted up. Well, one of the missiles and bones hit the fold in the space between her leg and her left hip. And if that, that material puffed up, a piece of bone with blood hit it. They caught the pointed end and the blood, the angular drop, go from down to up. Where in fact, if she were uh, standing up, it would go from up to down. But in this case, the little defect in the blood was going in an upward direction to put her on the gun. And that's significant. That's reconstruction. That's taking all these components. As you started out, Lanson. Uh, uh, you said out talking about the different disciplines. Pathology and DNA are two huge pieces of information uh, for reconstructionists. And that's what we have here uh, in this particular case, a 28-year-old case, and the intermediate target was her hand. That's all that I have. I uh, think allow me to spend this time with you. We were asking you just a little bit. You were talking about DNA evidence and all of this. In your reconstruction, one of the things that we noticed as teachers that you mentioned quite a bit was uh, angles and also your force and your droplet. So how much math and physics do you really use every day? You use a lot. You, you have to understand physics, but I know that that's what you teach, math and physics. Math comes in a simplistic form of being able to make you're seeing. Being able to know what you know the math system is and the English system is, being able to measure, and also when you get into blood spain, there's some trigonometry that is used to determine the angle, but that's not quite accurate. Indicator he or she or someone with a lot of crime scene experience can go into a scene and see the cast off droplets and know the origin of where they are from. But the crime lab People in the crime lab want to really determine the accuracy and will do some trigonometry uh, and get the arc sign of the width divided by the length and it will give you an angle uh, to where it comes from. You need to pick out certain ones and that's where the discrepancies come in because different interpretations can be made from those. As I said, an investigator, not one stain does a pattern make, but you take multiple stains and you can see its origin. Some knowledge of it. You do not have to have, as an investigator, uh, you do not have to have or be a mathematician or to be uh, a major to be able to go in and solve a crime. Thank you so very much for your time. Um, you fight for a little traveler, that is for sure. And so you have been so gracious to accommodate us no matter where you are. So we greatly appreciate it and we wish you well on your journeys and we look forward to having some questions the same way from the blog. Okay.
Thank you. Okay, welcome. I will then listen. I will mute myself and go off the TV. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, now we've determined exactly that we do have a death and we have blood stains and everything. Now we have murder weapons that we're going to look at. So we're going to look at our ballistics. So we have to use ballistics experts and firearms experts to play a major role in identification of the of the crime, the crime and the criminal that is involved and have true conviction, you have to have evidence. You just can't point your finger at someone and say, this is the person that did it or this is the guy that shot it. So this is where we come in or where our ballistics come in. Our arms expert is uh, going to analyze our casings and he's going to uh, look at the markings on the bullets that they find at the crime scene. Victims are also going to be tested and compared to the bullets fired from the gun that is handed over uh, to the, by the law enforcement officer. And we're going to check out a bullet that uh, can tell us where the gun was fired and what it, which one it was fired from. We're very fortunate to have another expert with us that is a ballistics expert, and this is Mr. Jeffrey Gill. He was the Jefferson Regional Forensic Laboratory in Louisville, Kentucky. And Mr. Gill, would you like? To tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started and your ed education. Sure. Um, well, I graduated from, as you see there, I graduated from Eastern Kentucky University back in 1978. And I a science degree. Back in 1978, there weren't a lot of universities that had forensic science programs. Eastern Kentucky University started one shortly after I uh, started, uh, I was enrolled there. So um, I was able to get a two-year criminalistics degree after I'd started in law enforcement at Eastern, and criminalistics uh, degree uh, program, we did a tour of the uh, Kentucky State Police Crime Laboratory. And at that tour, uh, I noticed that the uh, farm section was one that, that, uh, inter that I took an interest in uh, because I was an avid shooter at the time, uh, interested in firearms. And so once I graduated from Eastern, um, I applied for a position at the laboratory in 1979 and was hired uh, by the Kentucky State Police to be a firearms and tool market center trainee. And uh, the rest of history, I've been doing it for uh, 32 years now, uh, thoroughly enjoying a firearms and tool market examiner. The first two years of that, involved training to be a firearms and tool mark examiner. So from 1979 until 1981, I had a two-year training program. And, and firearms and tool mark identification is a, a fairly specialized field. And, and you don't learn a lot about firearms and tool mark identification going to college. So most of the training is in-house in a, in a forensic government laboratory. And, and as I said, it, usually the minimum training period is two years. A farm and tool market examiner was allowed to actually do case work. A good showing of you shows you in front of a microscope. Would you tell us, is that a virtual comparison microscope? Uh, that is not. That is actually an optical comparison microscope. Um, you look at the objectives there that are just to the to the left of uh, of me, and I look into that microscope. A computer microscope is basically two microscopes that are mounted together at the top by an optical bridge. And when you look in the microscope, you see a round field of view. You have two bullets. There's two different stages, the right and left stage. You can mount a bullet on the left stage. You can, you can mount it on the right stage. And when you look in the microscope, you'll see those two objects sitting next to each other. And the microscope that allows you to manipulate those bullets to, to swing them around and look at the markings that were placed on those bullets as they traveled down the barrel of the firearm. Uh, barrel have what we call rifling in them, and the ring is there. It's a series of grooves that are cut at the length of the barrel. They have a spiral. They'll either spiral to the right or spiral to the left. And that uh, the rifle is placed in there to give the gun its accuracy. Uh, I believe it is an object just like a football. If you're going to throw a football, you all know that to, to 
accurate. The quarterback has to get a good spiral on, on that football. So when they throw spiraling and it tends to be accurate, if the quarterback gets hit just before he releases the football and he gets that spiral, you, you've seen it before where the foot will tumble in over in and it's not very accurate. Bowling down range from the gun have to be spinning just like that football because they are an oblong object. If they don't spin, they're going to tumble in over in and they become a lot less accurate. It's a principle of gyroscopic stability and it allows that bullet to spin and be uh, much more accurate. Then that process, the guns, in, in seeing that bullet, they scratch the outer surface of that bullet and leave their marks, that the barrel leaves its mark on every bullet fired down that barrel. And as a firearms examiner, my job is to microscopically examine the bullets, find out if a, what we, you could, could refer to as signature of that barrel is present, and if it's present on an evidence bullet and they recover a firearm that they think may be the suspect firearm, I'll test fire that, that firearm usually three times in a water tank, recover the test bullets, and examine those test bullets to see if um, the gun producing very good marks. And if the gun producing good marks, I can look at the evidence bullet to see if the same marks are present on that evidence bullet. It's so a process of a compared analysis and looking at patterns, and we call it pattern recognition or pattern match recognition as well. But um, microscopically looking for these marks that are placed on the ammunition components in the firing process. Very impressed with your website, and I know that's one of the things we're going to look at here in just a minute. But also, you were talking about a water tank. Does all the ballistics that you try, does all of that information and that testing, is it all in a water tank? <laughs> well, I did in the tank. Uh, but we fire into a water tank to recover the fired bullets. So the bullets come out of the gun at a very high velocity, so we have to have some some mechanism for recovering those bullets in a fairly undamaged state. We want to look at the marks that are on the sides of the bullets that are transferred there from the inside of the barrel of the gun. A walk allows us to do that by pointing the gun at water, firing the gun, the bullets come out of the gun at a high velocity, they, they strike the water, and from, from passing through the water slows the bullets down and they end up just on the bottom of the water tank. So recover those bullets off of the bottom of the water tank and use those as standards for comparing back to the evidence bullets that are collected from the crime scene. In that same process, we'll have three fired bullets and three fired cartridge cases developed as standards in firing that gun. So the way is used to recover the bullets, but in that same process, the gun will either eject cartridge casings, fired cartridge casings, or if it's a revolver, the three cartridge casings will be removed manually from the cylinder for comparison to casings that may be found at the scene as well. We all have a water tank, and so we're going to let the kids watch this right now so that they'll kind of have an idea of what you're talking about. Okay. okay.
the video that we just saw showed all of the things that Mr. Bell had talked about previously. And he has been the wonderful, I guess, uh, developer of a website that we're going to look at. Pat played with this quite a bit, and I have to tell you that I'm very embarrassed to say we would not make very good forensic or ballistics experts because we didn't get very of them, many of them matched correctly. And Mr. Doyle has a website that is up at the top that you're seeing on the slide now. That is www.firearmsid.com. And you can go to that website, and we're going to let him tell about the website and what you have to do to register to be on it. And when you finish this, you can print you off a certificate that tells you how successful you have been in completing your exercise. So we're 25% successful, which is not something to be real proud of and not something that a jury would want for us to uh, look at. Uh, we're going to go through and uh, let him talk about his website and what you have to do. Also, so one thing that you need to realize is it, it's free. So this is really a wonderful thing for you to be able to play with and to see in order to find um, out ballistic the thing that you would like to uh, entertain doing. So Mr. Bill, if you could tell us how to register and to log in. Sure. Um, well, in that slide you're showing right now, you've got a big red arrow pointed to the, the word register. So it's not too difficult to be in a registration simply means you just have to enter an email address and your name. The symbol will then return to you a password that you use to log into the resource area. And just above where it says register, you'll see username and password block uh, uh, fields there. You enter that in and hit login, and that will take you into the resource area where I have a number of, of different exercises uh, created to allow you to somewhat understand uh, more about firearms identification and how we, as firearms examiners, compare and match bullets and cartridge cases. Um, the way itself, there are a number of resources in addition to that. If anyone goes and, and they're interested in taking those exercises, I would highly recommend you go first to a main menu, the very first tab that says firearms identification go through that entire section and read through that and get a good understanding of the of the science of firearms and tool mark identification before you go and try the the virtual virus and microscope is what I refer to uh, the exercise, the uh, interface that we created. You can see that there's a bullet ID VCM, which VCM stands for virtual compare microscope. And below there's the cartridge case ID virtual compare microscope. Uh, these are written in Flash, and, and so you have Flash installed on your, your, in your browser, which is a pretty default thing anymore for anybody. If you go to YouTube and you watch videos, then you've got Flash installed on your browser. But by clicking on that bullet, I, logging in and registering and coming back here and coming and clicking on Bullet ID VCM will launch that will take you through various exercises. And they get better as you go along. Uh, the, the, the exercises are the first one, bullet identification comparison microscope. Uh, it will allow you to compare four zones to four uh, sets of standards that uh, come from four different ones, and you try to figure out which unknown bullet was fired from which gun. And as you said, the uh, not uh, it's a real pushover type of test. You have to, uh, when you look at patterns and try to determine which, which bullet was from which, which gun. Uh, um, can you the next slide there? I'm not sure. There we go. The interface, and you can see on the left, there, there's images there that say unknowns, and on there are standards. You can adjust the magnification. You can uh, you click on first unknown, it'll bring up an image. Now, bullets are round objects. And I, I had mentioned earlier that the barrels have rifling, and there are different patterns to the rifling. The bullets in this exercise are ones that had six lands and grooves cut in the barrel with a right hand twist. Bringing up this first uh, unknown 
and then your first standard. There's a little stick at the bottom that allows you to move the images around on each side and carry them to each other. You can, again, there's a magnification adjustment, but you're only looking at one image of six for each side. So there, if you go around the circumference of that bullet, land impressions, there are six land impressions. So you have to look at the six individual items or six individual images uh, on each side and have to find the pattern that matches between the two objects that are in the field of view there. So, so image one on the left match and image five on the right. So you have to go through the six images and the area you need to concentrate on is the, in these images, if you look at them, the, the left edge of the image contains the striae. That's the base of the bullet being the left edge. So what you want to do is find out of the, if you start your own first unknown, go through the six images, and you do that by clicking on one through six. I don't know if you see over there to the left, uh, uh, below the center of the, of the scope image, it says select land impression. You go one through six. Well, you can find the land impression that shows the most detail, the most dry up. Uh, as being a series of scratches, then concentrate on the left edge, bring that using the joystick over to center line. Bring those that stria over to the center line and find the one that has the best set of stria uh, through six images and stay with that one image. Load the first standard on the right and through those six images and see if you find a pattern that matches the, the best of the six that you that you loaded on the left side. That's kind of a little a little part in how to work it, but when you get an identification, you'll see that once you line up say land one on the left to land five on the right, you then rotate those bullets what we call in phase. You would take the left one to image two and the right one to image six. And you should find additional correspondence. As you go around the surface of the bullet, now that you have them in place, you will find correspondence on every land impression as you go around. Well, I think you've made a, an identification. You click, you click the little button down on the bottom right that says it's a match. And when you do that, you then move to the next unknown and repeat the process, and you try to find the, the, the four matches that exist in this exercise. And if you do get 100%, it pops up a little certificate that you can print out that says that you scored 100% on the virtual comparison microscope exercise one. And you can see Tim and I were not very successful. We played with this. We played with this for about two hours, and we uh, didn't even agree between ourselves. And so you can see that 25%. Uh, is much uh, our forte. Well, and so we did have a lot of fun with the ballisto, and it is something I really, really think that you all should try. And this is just the bullet. So one thing I want to emphasize is that when you register, they send you an email that, that will give you a code to get back into the website. So you will have to check your email to get that code. And after you do the bullet, you can go on and you can do the casing. So let's look at the casing. You know, would you like to walk us through this one again, please, sir? Sure. You click on that link, and it will take you to the, it will load the interface for the cartridge case virtual comparison microscope. I uh, will have a number of exercises there as well, but this is a very similar interface to the other one. Uh, but in this particular case, we have eight unknowns and eight knowns. Um, it's a little bit different, but you can see the images, and what you're looking at is firing pin impression and the primer area of the cartridge case. It's at the base of the cartridge case. That's where the firing pin of the gun strikes the, the cartridge and, and, and fires that cartridge. You get these impressions on our areas that um, can are reproduced from one cartridge case to the next that are fired in that same gun. You move these images around in a very similar fashion to move the images around in the bullet comparison microscope, but there's a couple of different things you have to focus 
these. It's like using a microscope. When you put an object on a microscope, you have to focus that object. So there are focus tabs on the right and left edges of the microscope uh, field of view there. It allows you to focus those images. And you can also you also have to rotate. These images look, look in at a random rotation orientation. So you have to rotate them and get that get those marks kind of running at a parallel uh, direction of running right to left. That allows you then to pull those objects to the center line and look for patterns that match um, the two two images that you have loaded. And then you also submit your results and you will you'll get a score as well. So uh, it's very similar to the other virtual person microscope, but this is with cartridge cases. So when you have scenes and cartridge cases and bullets are collected, this basically is how a firearms examiner goes through uh, using the real comparison microscope to make identifications with the objects that are collected at the crime scene. Did you ever testify in court? Yes, I do. I testify routinely in the courts in the Kentucky uh, court system. Um, in Louisville, Kentucky, I, I routinely testify in the courts here in Louisville, Kentucky, but I testified throughout the state of Kentucky as well as in federal courts as well. I've, testified, I've probably testified over the 32 years, um, oh, I would say at least five or 600 times in, in criminal investigation. Uh -huh. Is something that is nerve wracking or is it just a kind of old hat now? Well, every case is a little different and you have to go in and testify and you have to be ready and you have to be prepared like you would with any other um, case. Uh, it's not as nerve wracking as it was initially when I first started 32 years ago, obviously, but um, it's still, it, every is a little unique and the, they're different. People asking questions, and the questions are usually not asked the same way twice. So uh, it's uh, it had easier, but, but it's still a, a challenge going in. And and, and, go, and testifying in court is, is yeah, the biggest part of it is explaining the science to the jury and allowing them to understand how I conducted my analysis and how I arrived at the conclusions that I arrived at. And so the, the more novel they be of the process, the more informed they can be, and they can make a more informed decision in that, in that brief process. We want to thank you for being with us today, and, and what an honor it has been for you to be with us and to explain your website. And uh, to reinforce to the kids that in order to be a forensic science, that you re scientist, you really do have to have a degree in, in tree physics, biology, but also that that speech communication is a very important asset that they have to have whenever they testify. So thank again, for joining us. Thank you. With it, I agree, and on-the-job training is always going to be something that you're going to want to look into. The more that you, when you find an area of interest that you really like, find you an expert in that area and talk to experts. In PAMA, and one of the things that we have learned in doing all of these presentations is that you have a vast knowledge and wealth of people that out there that are very willing to talk to you and to help you. All those hard and fast rules regarding qualifications for a person who is wishing to be a forensic scientist, you need to remember that any kind of specialization in science is always welcome. And a degree in science or a degree in anything is going to open doors so that you can further uh, invest investigations and, and your job knowledge. We do the uh, contact information for Mr. England and Mr. Dole. Um, they're listed there. I will have our blog web page up and running so that if you have any questions, you may send them to me through the blog website. That site is listed below on the screen that you see. And this way I can collect all of those questions can email those to um, our expert speakers today and uh, kind of uh, minimize their time level so that they can see all of the, the questions at one time and they can send those answers to me by email and they'll go in and, and post those answers from our expert uh, speakers to the blog page. I've been watching and asking that if any students that are attending
attending today. If you have any questions, if you want to type those into the chat box, we'll be more than welcome to collect those. Uh, this has been a very interesting uh, webinar, one of the, the more interesting ones that we've had. And we really appreciate our speakers and expert, uh, expert presenters today, Mr. Englert and Mr. Dole, for sharing their time and their expertise in their different areas. We remind you that we do have a couple of other webinars. Um, the one I have highlighted in red that's coming up in March, we are currently looking at uh, changing the date for the March webinar to maybe March 20th or so. We're aware that many students uh, have spring break that's taking place during that March 13th. And so we're looking at maybe making that a little bit later in March so that we can accommodate students and teachers as well so that uh, if you have their plans during that spring break time, we'll be able to accommodate those. The, the March webinar is going to be uh, covering the topic of environmental toxicology. And we'll have one more webinar in April that will be coming up. And it's covering the electrical and computer engineering with RFID microchips. We have some very interesting topics that are much different than the ones that we had today. But we would like to thank you so much for sharing your time today. Uh, again, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. And so I will have that webinar link. It will be emailed out to our speakers as well as to um, all of our students so that um, we can show that link. You can download it. You can watch it uh, at, at your convenience. Or you can share it with others that might not have been able to make it today. So we'd like to thank you very much for your time. And, uh, we certainly hope to see you in March. Please check our web page for updated uh, um, date in March. It's looking like it might be March 20th, but that date will be placed on the web page once that has been um, confirmed. So a yeah, big thank you out to our expert speakers as well as to our students and audience today. We appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. We hope you have a great day, and we'll see you in March.